the value of filling in weather data gaps. These data gaps are having a major negative impact on the early warning services that we have more human losses because of high impact weather events. Flying through Arctic clouds. It's a BA-146 aircraft that's a, essentially a medium-sized passenger plane. We can fly some 50 feet over the sea. It can be quite bumpy at times. And how hot will it actually get? Most areas will see sunny skies, a lot of dry weather and daytime temperatures rising. It's Friday the 8th of July and you're listening to Weather Snap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and welcome to Weather Snap, an insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Reliable weather and climate forecasts are vital for responding to the risks posed by climate change and extreme weather events. A thorough network of observational data acts as the basis for these projections. Local forecasting in any given location benefits from improved observations from all over the globe. However, there are many parts of the world where current weather data, such as daily temperature, rainfall and sunshine, is sparse or even non-existent. To address these data gaps, an international initiative led by the World Meteorological Organization was launched last week. It's called the Systematic Observational Financing Facility, or SOF. To find out more, I spoke to Pateri Tallis, Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization. We have major gaps in the basic observing systems, especially ground-based stations. We have a lack of uh, ground-based stations worldwide, especially in least developed countries, uh, mainly in Africa and, and also on Pacific and Caribbean islands. Uh, and then we have also lack of so-called sounding observations, which are balloon soundings, which give you the vertical profile of meteorological parameters. And those gaps are having major negative impact on the accuracy of early warning services. We have also difficulties in describing what is the normal climatic conditions in those data sparse areas. It's a massive problem because if you think about the whole of Africa, much of South America, it's millions upon millions of people who are living on the front line of climate change. And when it comes to observational data, I presume remote sensing, satellite imagery, which measures many metrics, is just not enough. Actually, we need both. With satellites, we have been able to enhance the amount of data that we have as an input for the forecast. But besides that, we need ground-based measurements for ground truthing of the satellite. So these are complementary to each other. And by having both ground-based balloon sounding and satellite data, you will get optimal input to the forecast models. Can you explain to me the depth and the breadth of this problem in terms of impacts for communities? At WMO, we know that only half of our members have proper early warning services in place. And these data gaps are having having a major negative impact on the early warning services. And that means that uh, that we have more casualties, uh, human losses uh, because of high impact weather events. And we have also the growing economic losses related to these uh, high impact weather events. And there we have to invest in these observing systems. We have to invest in the manpower capacity development at the national med services and uh, also private sector. On a practical level, are people conducting these observations or will it be automated? It depends on the countries uh, and uh, in principle, uh, as a principle, uh, these automatic weather stations are the recommended way, but it depends on the country. In some countries where the salary levels are not very high, even these manual old-fashioned stations make sense. And these are, of course, easier to maintain as the automatic uh, weather stations. What do you expect the results to be? What positive impact do you think it will have on communities and countries? It has been demonstrated that the investments in in meteorological services is a very powerful way to adapt to climate change. And uh, in in Global Adaptation Commission report led by Ban Ki-moon a couple of years ago, demonstrated that you will get the money back 20-fold that you invest in these services and related infrastructure. So that's a good investment to mitigate the climate and disaster risks. We have been demonstrating during the past 50 years we have seen a five-fold increase in the economic losses related to weather events, thanks to ongoing climate change. So we have to pay attention to all these infrastructures and services. Pateri Tallis. In other weather news this week, a fourth major flood in two years hit the greater Sydney region in Australia last week. 
Whilst local forecasts had been indicating low pressure and heavy rain for days before, the volume of water that eventually fell was far higher than expected, with a year's worth of rain in places. 50,000 people were called to evacuate. Australia's Bureau of Meteorology has said the record-breaking rain can be linked to several climate drivers. La Nina is known to bring the risk of enhanced rainfall to eastern Australia. During this recent rainfall event, very warm waters off the east coast of Australia provided extra energy and moisture, contributing to a deep area of low pressure and leading to high concentrations of heavy rain. While the threat of heavy rain in New South Wales has eased, intermittent showers will continue through the rest of this week and possibly into next week. Well, here in the UK, newspapers and social media have been alive with speculation following burying reports of a heat wave. So where does the truth lie? Here's Aidan McGiven. So Aidan, there's been a lot of talk over the last week, really, of this imminent heat wave, particularly picked up in the press. And now the temperatures are really rising, aren't they? Well, high pressure has been to the west of the UK throughout the week, and that's led to a lot of fine and dry weather in the south. Although around the top of that high, we've seen changeable weather move into northern parts of the UK. Now, through the weekend and especially into the start of next week, that high really dominates the weather. It moves in from the west, becomes established over the top of the UK. And as a result, most areas will see sunny skies, a lot of dry weather and daytime temperatures rising. It's not just the UK seeing that high heat. The forecast for Western Europe seems very hot as well. Yeah, the whole of Western Europe will be affected by this high pressure, building heat over the weekend and through next week. And by early to mid next week, parts of France could see temperatures rising into the low 40s and parts of Spain could see temperatures hitting the mid 40s. We've never seen a recorded official temperature of 40 degrees here in the UK, but it's not out of the question, is it? No, with a background level of global warming, the chances each year of hitting 40 degrees in the UK increase. It is still unlikely. Recent computer model runs have come up with 40 degrees in their extended range forecast. But these are a, really a low minority of computer model runs. They, they show the possibility of 40 degrees, but at the moment it looks very unlikely for this upcoming spell of hot weather. However, 32 degrees Celsius is still very hot for us, isn't it? And the Met Office has issued a heat alert level three. Can you explain what that is? Well, these heat alerts are advice to health professionals and they're issued when we have a combination of high daytime temperatures and very warm nights. And that means that vulnerable people can't get relief from the heat. And it's really advice that vulnerable people could experience impacts. And in this country, that counts as high 20s, low 30s by day, mid to high teens by night. Finally, let's talk about wildfires. Other parts of the world have a wildfire season and sometimes it does hit the news, say Canada last year. However, we're quite lucky in this country. Yes, we do see bushfires, but not to the extent. But recent research has suggested something slightly different. Yeah, it looks like wildfires are already increasing in frequency. And all the signals are that a warming UK climate lead to an increased risk of wildfires hitting the UK in the future. Ada McGiffin, thank you very much. Earlier this year, a team of scientists took to the skies of northern Scandinavia to study cloud formations in the Arctic Circle. The aim? To better understand the systems that shape weather across the whole of the northern hemisphere. One of those involved was Steve Abel, scientific manager in cloud and aerosol research here at the Met Office. The Met Office-led Arctic Colder Outbreak Project was set up to examine cloud systems in colder outbreak weather regimes. These form in the Arctic as cold polar air flows from the marginal ice zone, which is the transitional area between the sea and dense Arctic drift ice. These cloud systems can bring hazardous weather into mainland Europe and even down to the UK. So we often see heavy snow showers in these colder outbreaks brought down into Scotland, for example. Mixed phase clouds contain a mixture of ice and water particles and are notoriously difficult for our weather and climate models to simulate. 
The aim of this experiment was to make in situ measurements of these clouds in order to improve our understanding of some of the key processes involved in mixed cloud formation. The FAM Airborne Laboratory is a world-class research aircraft. It's a BAE 146 aircraft that's a, essentially a medium-sized passenger plane without a lot of the seats and filled with scientific instrumentation. We can fly some 50 feet over the sea for around about five hours duration, up to about 11 kilometers in the atmosphere. Typical flights will last about five hours and we can carry up to 18 scientists on board. And those scientists are responsible for guiding the mission and also support the operation of up to four tons of scientific equipment on the aircraft at any time. During this project, we had scientists from multiple UK institutes involved, the Met Office, Leeds and Manchester University, supported by staff at the FAM airborne facility itself. We did have several other research aircraft projects from agencies across Europe that took place alongside ours with complementary science objectives. So we had French, Norwegian and German teams. When flying through the clouds, we can make measurements of the concentration of different cloud particles, whether they're droplets, whether they're ice. We can size individual cloud particles as we're flying through at 100 meters per second. We can measure individual cloud particles with specialized probes that hang under the wings of the aircraft. The aircraft can be quite noisy with all the instrumentation running. We'll all be wearing headsets so that we can communicate with one another around the aircraft, including with the pilots at the front. Particularly when we're flying at low level or within certain clouds, it can be quite a turbulent environment. So it can be quite bumpy at times and you have to have your sea legs on you at times as well to, to keep you going. Longer term down the line, we'll be using these measurements to improve the way we can represent these mixed phase clouds in our models. That will improve our weather forecasts of the sort of hazardous weather conditions we get in these cloud regimes. The super cooled liquid water that's present in these mixed phase clouds can be important for aviation forecasts, for example and we'll be able to better represent how these clouds are simulated in climate models. The way we can simulate these clouds in our climate models, we'll have more faith and confidence in the way those clouds respond in a future climate. Just before we go, Martin Bowles is here with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes for last week, starting on Monday the 27th of June and ending on Sunday the 3rd of July. The highest recorded temperature of the week was 24.2 degrees Celsius, measured at Heathrow Airport in Greater London on Sunday. The coldest place was Dalwini in Venetia, where 3.9 degrees were measured early on Friday morning. The largest daily rainfall was 31.0 mm at Castley in the far north of Scotland on Friday. The sunniest place was Shoeburyness in Essex, where 13.1 hours of full sunshine was recorded on Saturday. Thanks, Martin. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.